What's up, gangsters? If you've seen my previous video, you know I've been hanging out with Troma co-founder Lloyd Kaufman, as one does. <laughs> and, um, well, through my interactions with him, I got in contact with a young filmmaker named Rocco Zevenbergen, who directed a feature-length movie that got distributed all over the place. Which I found rather impressive, so I wanted to find out more, which I did. I mean, I watched the movie, talked to the director, and well, that's, um, that's basically what's on the menu for today. So, first, my quick thoughts on I Need You, Dad. That's the name of the movie we're talking about. Right off the bat, this is pretty awesome. I, I really dig the whole visual, you know, like the stylistic approach. Very trauma-esque. And not just because of all the different memorabilia and the Lloyd Kaufman cameo, which is pretty hilarious. But also, you know, like, for example, listen to this. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of fun. But um, do not get me wrong, I really do not want to diminish this movie to just it being you know, like influenced by trauma. So um, let's see. We follow Dude. He's this somewhat angsty teenage punker, you know, like going to parties, he meets this girl. But then he also meets this creature with whom he then seems to form a rather special bond. There's also a whole extra layer to the movie that I, you know, like I don't really want to give away, but which leans heavily into the whole, you know, like creative aspect of creating art, which is actually done rather clever. You know, like it's funny, but <laughs> it also gets pretty disturbing. In general, it's it's kind of hard to put this movie in a box, which I like. Is it a comedy? Because it is pretty funny. Is it horror? Maybe. But it also has a bit of an artsy touch to it. Visually, there's some great gags, but also it like it uses its visual quality as some kind of storytelling device, which is you know like. Pretty cool. like it, it gets pretty meta. On top of which, you have some fun, like, like actually, like decently written characters, like some you actually care for, and this pretty dope soundtrack. It's it's pretty varied, but also comes with bits of like these somewhat moody synthscapes that I kind of love. I mean, they're rather effective. All of which was done on a rather low budget, which again, like I said at the very beginning, I thought was. Very impressive. The thing is, I, I, I just do not want to talk about like, like give away too much of the movie as I feel like, you know, like going in as blind as possible, which is what I did, is definitely the best approach for this movie. So instead, let's just talk to Rocco itself. I do, I can imagine that uh, most of my audience might not be familiar with you. Can you just tell a little bit about yourself? Not even like a filmmaker, just like, where you come from, how you rolled into anything. Yeah, I uh, I kind of was a kid of the YouTube age when I was about 10 years old. Uh, YouTube was like a pretty new and exciting thing. And so I really gravitated as a child towards just like all these people making videos and wanting to uh, be a part of that. And it was kind of at a time where if you posted anything at all, uh, it would blow up because there wasn't a lot of competition. Um, and so just as a kid, I just started making videos and it was just me playing with toys and like screaming like a child. Uh, but they were like little stories and they would get like 40, 50,000 hits on every video. Now I only can pray for those kind of numbers. I mean, it's hilarious, but, uh, uh, but yeah, so I like just as a kid, I was like, wow, I really want to do this, you know? And so just kind of like, it's always been filmmaking, being a director has kind of always been what I've wanted in life and fast forward to being coming out of high school, dropping out of college. Cause I was like, this isn't working for me. I really just want to make a movie. And I made, I need you dead. But like you said, you started out doing maybe initially just like you would say, like call them YouTube videos, but you've made shorts. Um, while doing that, was that in a way preparation for you eventually doing a feature length or was that like the furthest thing from your mind while you were working on those? Yeah, you know, I don't think it, I was consciously like, I'm just getting ready to do a feature. Like, I don't think that was ever what it was. I think it was like, I've always really wanted to make feature films ever since I was very young, but it just never struck me as something that I needed to do until it did. And so, um, yeah, it was always just like making shorts was easy, fun. I got to see it right away. I got to put it out there into the world and get people's feedback. Um, and then uh, sometime around high school, I started taking my shorts more seriously. I would actually audition people. 
I did a film noir called uh, Tears of Gold. I did kind of like a Halloween style slasher ripoff called The Dead of Light. And then I did a trauma kind of gory slapstick tribute called Meat Lovers. And all three of those shorts I took like very seriously, storyboarded everything. And I was that was me kind of like making a transition from making videos to like films. And then um, once the idea for I Need You Dead started ruminating, it just kind of was this natural like, oh, this is going to be the first feature. Like I could just kind of feel it like this is a bigger story. This isn't going to be able to be told in five, ten minutes. And and yeah. Were all those um, those shorts because you have a your own company, you have Bad Taste Video, which you are the, the founder slash creative director, I assume, of. Um, can you tell a little bit about that company, like how, why you founded it, what your role is in it, what you've been up to with it? Uh, so Bad Taste Video is an LLC that we started maybe a couple of years ago. And originally it was kind of just to like have a company name attached to I Need You Dead, like copyright and stuff like that. Um, but Bad Taste Video is very much on the move and is growing in a major way. We have about uh, 10 to 15 team members at a time who are helping create graphics for stuff we're doing or like creating content for the YouTube channel, helping edit our trailers, um, help break. We have somebody who's working on the I Need You Dead album soundtrack release. Um, so, but ultimately what Bad Taste Video really is, um, is to kind of be um, an open door to people who don't have experience in the film industry to come on with us and have a shot. And ultimately with I Need You Dead, it was very much like, you don't need to have any experience in film whatsoever. Yes, we are making a feature film. Yes, this movie will play in some theaters. Yes, we're, we have an actual budget. It's not much, we had about 30 grand, but that's more than your average, you know, we're friends making a movie, right? So everybody got to come on and they got to have that kind of real tangible film set experience where they could make mistakes on our movie and get that film school that you know you just can't get sitting in a classroom so bad taste video is all about education through actual filmmaking a movie that's actually going to go out and you get to see the process from conception to marketing it when it's in theaters that's awesome do, do you feel like safe spaces like that that it's lacking in like the independent film circuit that's interesting i just think that the gap is too big i just think it's like there's too much of just like people helping each other with their little student films and their little commercials and things like that. And then there's the mega giants like ABC and Disney and all these guys who are making these super, super huge movies. And to get in there and to actually get some experience on set doing something interesting is like so, so many years of like climbing up the food chain and such. And, uh, to me, this is just a happy in between where it's like you get to be on a set where you get to read the script and be a part of some of the creative process. But it's not just your backyard movie. We're making a real movie that's going to be seen around the world and we're going to push it and we're going to have a substantial enough budget and we're going to promote it. And it's going to be something that you, as somebody new in the industry, can use as a calling card and say, hey, I was an assistant camera on I Need You Dead. You know, and, and people can Google I Need You Dead and see that that is a real movie that has existed and is being reviewed and talked about. And that's just, for somebody just trying to get into the industry, that can really be invaluable. So that's what Bad Taste is kind of all about. And I do think it's lacking. So that's why that's why we're here and that's why we're doing it. I, I know that in my audience, there are aspiring filmmakers. Maybe they're, they've done a few shorts. They want to move on to like a uh, feature length. Not to scare them off, but from the moment you decided to make it all the way up to you sitting there all proud with your premiere, what was the time span for that? I mean, it really depends on when you consider the start of that being, right? So like, um, if I had never made any of those short films, then like I could never have made this movie. So like, that takes me all the way back to high school. But if we're talking about just sitting down and writing the script and being like, the title of this movie is I Need You Dead. Um, you know, it was probably about two and a half years, roughly, I think is fair. Um, there was a script before this one called Cop Killer that kind of 
turned into this script a little bit and then covid elongated our like release in a major way um and like i'm still talking about it clearly and like booking it in theaters and such so the work really never ends but in terms of sitting down and, like we're gonna make this movie and then ah there it is on the screen two years two and a half years like i said i quite enjoyed it i couldn't help but think while watching that it is a a very personal movie which in a way is also maybe a scary thought <laughs> considering where the story takes itself so, um is, is is that true is there a lot of you in perhaps a story like maybe in certain characters is there yes it's an extremely personal movie um you know the main protagonist uh dude who is kind of this goth punk nervous kid who just doesn't really know how to fit in quite well um but it's kind of a high octane you know kid in his own right um yeah that was definitely me um like the year leading up to making this movie where i was like running around at house shows wearing black lipstick and wearing my long trench coat and like having my black hair or whatever like that was very much me and during that time i was dealing with depression in like a pretty major way and when the idea of doing a movie about that came to me in the form of kind of like this horror movie with this creature and a kid and this kind of like inner conflict visualized in the style of a Frank Henenlotter type movie, um, I was just like, wow, this is going to be me really putting up my inner craziness on screen. And that's going to make that's going to be really hard for me and really vulnerable for me. But that is what made it worth being a feature and like dedicating this amount of time to. And it was extremely uh, cathartic to make this movie. And I think it really helped me deal with my depression in a major way. So it being personal was really uh, benefit beneficial to me. The filmmaking, the filmmaker character in the movie, he also deals a lot with not just investors, but at some point also just cast and crew getting very much involved with the creative process. Is that something you actively experience or is that something you just know is part of the, the creative process? Um, you know, I mean, anybody who is an artist out there trying to do their thing is always going to have their naysayers, especially when you're doing well. Um, you will always have people who are turning or telling you that they could do it better or this or that. Well, actually, when I when we started shooting I Need You Dead, I actually haven't, I've never talked about this before, but when we started shooting I Need You Dead, um, I actually had an, like, an old teacher uh, from my school email me and they had always wanted to like make a movie. And I like uploaded a pitch video where I was kind of pitching the project and like, it was like, a, it was like for a fundraising thing. Um, and they reached out to me and they were like, you know, that story idea sounds really like dumb. Like why, I think you should reconsider. I think you should go back and rewrite you know, I just feel like I just don't think that's the right idea. And I was just like, oh, my God, like this teacher from my high school sees I'm doing something cool and they just like shit on me because they have some unaccomplished thing within them. And they got I mean, it's like it's crazy. It's crazy when you like put yourself out there to take a chance who will come out of the word woodwork to like kind of tear you down. So, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a real thing, I will say. Once we were shooting I Need You Dead, everybody who was involved in the project was like super positive. We were a big family. Of course, like I was stressed out of my mind making this movie. It was intense, um, but nothing to do with the crew. Like the crew loved the movie. Everyone who read the script like adored it and thought it was super creative and super cool. Um, it's just hard to make movies. So like when I was, you know, kind of playing myself in the movie, um, I was definitely channeling a lot of that stress and inner anxiety um, that I was feeling while we were shooting. So it's, it's kind of an interesting blend of everything, but my crew was amazing. So the filmmaker character, he also says at some point, and I quote, it's not about the money, it's about the art. Is this something that you and like Bad Taste Video, is that something that that means a lot that you really stand for or is that like like how 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 true is that for you yeah well in the context of i need you dead 
and that scene you're talking about, I think the director is is very much in the wrong there. Um, because, okay, what he's saying in some res- in, in a different situation, what he's saying is true. Um, but in that situation, it's like, you got to understand when people are working on these things and you're paying them very little, you know, they are doing you a service. They are sacrificing a part of themselves to help you and for a greater, for what they believe to be a greater cause. And so you have to understand that and you have to respect that. And I think there is a blurry line. And I I know this very well because I just worked for Troma for like seven months. (laughs) So I know very well the whole concept of like, basically there's, there's like, you know, the top dogs who just get a thousand dollars a minute for folding napkins for a walking Phoenix on the Joker set. And then there's trauma where you're the lead actor of the movie and you get paid in peanuts. And I would like, I need you, I would like a bad taste video that is to be somewhere in the middle where it's like, look, it's not, you know, you're not getting that million dollars an episode like they do on these TV shows and stuff like that. Like once it gets to that point, I believe it becomes unethical because it's like that money could be going to like a starving country or something. These multi-million dollar Marvel movies Literally, if they just didn't make the new Spider-Man movie and donated all of it to like a third world country, their like world hunger, their hunger problems would end. It's like crazy that we sacrifice that just for a piece of entertainment. I think that's super immoral. But on the other side, if you're going to ask people to work constantly for you, then you got to understand and pay them nothing. Then you have to understand that it's in their hands. If they want to walk away, They have every right to, and you should just be happy they showed up at all. Like, you just, you got to understand that. So so there's a fine line, but. Were there at some point choices that you made in in the filmmaking process that you were like, this might go a little bit against how I want it to be, but it it will work in my favor for getting it on certain platforms or were there like choices you had to make? No, no compromises. With okay, yeah, movie. compromise is the word, sorry, exactly. Yeah, okay. No, no, it's okay. There, there were no compromises uh, for I Need You Dead at all, really. Um, I made the movie that I, the exact movie that I wanted to make, and I didn't think it would get as far as it did. It got picked up for distribution. It's on multiple streaming platforms. You can buy it on DVD, on Best Buy, Walmart, Barnes and Noble's websites. Um, I thought that it was too crazy to do that kind of stuff. I think it's a it's an insane, pretty experimental, uh, at times frustrating movie to watch, uh, but it's out there. So hey, woo! I also want to ask you a little bit about your influences for making this movie. Obviously, we have trauma. Besides the fact that I know that you've worked for trauma, um, there's like the 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 citizen toxic posters and like the, the shirts and, and and all of that and. Um, it's funny, you, you mentioned it earlier already. I wanted to tell you, like, hey, was maybe like a Frank Hanalot or like a Basket Gage, like a, a brain damage, was that an influence for you? Could you tell me a little bit about what influenced you? And maybe just in general, as I'm curious personally, like maybe like your love for these type of like genre movies? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it like it did for many people, uh, my love for the, the genre of horror and just kind of genre in general was The Evil Dead. Like that was that was the starting point. That's what got me hooked. Um, that was the high that ne- could never be beaten. <laughs> um, but mostly less to do with because of all the gore and everything, and more to do with watching something that was so just out of this world and just so just so captivating and different. But you could tell that they made it on a low budget, and you kind of got that feeling of like I could do that. I could figure some way out to do that. Um, and so that's what really got me going with Evil Dead. So that's number one. Then there was an ex- there's an experimental filmmaker called James Bell, who's currently making films. I don't know, maybe you've heard of him. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with his work. I'm, I'm not seeing any of it, but I know it's also rather controversial. Yeah, he's very controversial. Um, but I came across his film Tantrum. And that was about, I believe it's like a, 40 minute movie um and that's like insanely low budget um but it is hypnotically unique and visually stunning an amazing score 
special effects that will just blow your mind and and it's shot on like a little dv camera or something something very lo-fi but it 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 captured me in the same way that some million dollar whatever movie would capture me and that really like evil dead broke down some boundaries of what was possible that just like completely flattened everything where i was like anybody can make a brilliant movie i don't care who you are if you got the vision and you do it you're golden and so that movie had a huge inspiration and had a huge inspiration on kind of the final act of the movie where things get really experimental you watch that and you watch a james bell movie you'll see some definite similarities um and then to wrap it back to trauma um terra firmer was a huge inspiration on this movie it's my favorite of lloyd's movies lloyd playing himself as a blind movie director i mean terra firmer is definitely much more of a comedy than i need you dead is um but just the way that just to show the ugliness of the filmmaking process while also satirizing it in a funny kind of really ridiculous extreme way with those genre flavors um yeah terra firma was a huge influence uh, so you you've, you've worked i i just learned that you left trauma you worked there for a couple of months then uh seven months but that was then not all at the same time as you starting i need you dead because i was curious if they like trauma maybe their resources in any way contributed to the production of i need you dead no not really what it was more lloyd Lloyd contributed to I Need You Dead in a major way by he did a, he did a video with us at the start to help for fundraising. Um, he has a cameo in the movie, obviously, and he did that for free, um, which was super cool of him. And I was a pretty ridiculous cameo. And then obviously, when I started working at Troma, uh, he gave me pretty much free reign to just share I Need You Dead stuff on the Troma channels. Um, and to use, and that's obviously how I met you was like doing stuff through trauma. So, you know, trauma and Lloyd definitely had like a big impact on helping I need you dead and getting it out there. Um, I wish it could have been a trauma movie, um, officially, but they just aren't in a place right now to be able to do like a lot of Blu-ray releases and stuff and theatrical is just a lot harder these days. So I ended up having to go with some other distributor, but, um, in my heart, It's a trauma movie. Are there things like I wanted initially? I wanted to ask you like, well, what are some tips and tricks you could give? But I guess that's too broad. So I want to narrow it down to: Are there certain things that you wish you knew before you started production that could potentially like have helped you like starting it? Ah oh, man, you know, it's tough because honestly, uh, the answer is not really. Um, and hopefully, my my reason will be equally as helpful as whatever I could have said. To me, it's just like, everybody is looking for that golden piece of advice that's gonna like set their brain off to be like, ha, I can do it now. Like now that I know this tip, I'm ready to go. And it's just never, it's just, you know, you can write it down and that's great. Um, but ultimately you, it is, and it's that silly, silly old thing, but it's, it's, old for a reason it's just you just gotta go do it you just you just gotta go do it and as you're going you will learn and you will learn an entirely different set of things than what i learned making this movie um and i will get coffee or lunch with any single one of the people who watch this and go make a movie and we can share information but ultimately um you just gotta go in knowing that you don't know and that that's okay and it's going to be really really hard but if you believe in your vision and you problem solve one step at a time and it's like you don't don't let the whole grant like you were saying that two years it seems scary but you know when i was starting on this movie i wasn't thinking about two years i was thinking about page 87 right in front of me is this line funny or scary And you just take it one step at a time. You do your script, you get out there, you raise some money, you go cast people, you find lo some locations, you plan a, a good month where you can shoot everything day after day after day. And you get some friends or crew together who want that 
first time experience and you just take it one step at a time. And before you know it, you'll be in the theater watching your movie. And that's when you'll realize, oh my God, it's been two and a half years. You know what I mean? Or it's been one year or it's been five years, but you can't think about it that way. You just got to take it one day at a time and make your movie. I have been writing the script for my next feature for the past two and a half years, right? So do the math. <laughs> <laughs> so you have that whole two and a half year process of making the movie. You've managed to get your movie on several streaming websites, on, on uh, streaming platforms, on a physical release. Can you tell me a little bit about that process? Because you're probably at some point, you're so happy, like the movie is done, but in a way it only starts because you want people to see it. Uh, I read the first 10 pages of a book called Think Outside the Box Office. And in that first 10 pages, there was a line that said, uh, when you finish your movie, you're halfway there. And I remember reading that and it just ripped my heart in half because I really felt like I had crossed the finish line. But the second I read that line, I knew it was true. And like you make a movie so people can see it. That's the other half is getting people to see the thing that you made or else there's no point in making it. So getting people to see your movie, you know, it's its own artistry of its own. It's marketing, sales, emails, advertising, booking, events, theaters, live, this and that and everything in between. And so, you know, for a lot of filmmakers, that is just too much. And that's not what, a, especially if you're a director who's just artsy fartsy and you don't want to do any of the business. Um, so that's where distribution comes in. And, uh, you know, I, I did everything I could on my own to book I Need You Dead in theaters. During COVID, we built a drive-in outside of our office and we like did screenings that way off the side of our building. Like we did VHS, we did, we, we got some toys coming up. Like I'm always, I'm very entrepreneurial. So like, I'm always working on stuff, but like ultimately the distributor is the key way to kind of like give your film that second push that it needs. And if your film is good enough, um, then there is a distributor out there for you who will dedicate some time to getting you some press, to getting you on the streaming services, on DVD. Um, so it's just a matter of going out there and uh, pitching to distributors and talking to people who are with distributors. Oftentimes you're cold calling. For instance, I really wanted I Need You Dead to be on Shutter. That was like my thing for a year. I was like, I'm gonna get I Need You Dead on Shutter. I know it'd be a perfect fit. For those who don't know, Shutter is a pretty popular horror streaming platform. They're kind of the number one and they're owned by AMC. So I went to AMC's website and I found a list of numbers and email addresses of people who worked in distribution. And I called every single one of them and I left them a voicemail saying, hey, I'm Rocco. I got a movie, I Need You Dead. It's absolutely perfect for Shudder. You've got to hit me back and let's talk about this. And I must have called like a hundred people and none of them, nothing, radio silence. Two months later, one of them emailed me and they said, hey, we're interested in this actually. And they set me up with the Shutter people and I was talking with them for about a month or two. They were watching the movie and it didn't work out. But, 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 I talked to them. Now they know who I am. I have their contacts. And when I have the right project, I'll have my way in. It's all about this long-term battle as a filmmaker. And if you want to get your stuff out there, and I did, I continued to do this process and eventually landed the distribution deal that I have today with Mutiny Pictures. Um, but you know, you just got to be persistent and don't think that just because a door closes now that it could not help open the door later, you know? And so it's like count your failures as stepping stones for success later. That's, you know what I mean? And you can't let that slow you down. So I don't know, it's, it's just a lot of persistence, but you know, and you might not get distributed and that happens too. And just, you know, you got self-distribute and 
make another movie and count those failures. You know, you got those contacts now. And if they say, hey, we're not interested, say, hey, don't worry about it. My next movie is going to knock your socks off. So hang in there and I'll talk to you in a couple of years. Did I Need You Dad have like an official premiere, like the first time you watched it with an audience? That must be so freaking exciting. Like, can you tell me a little bit about how you experience your, because I think I read on the on the Bad Taste uh, video website also that you had like a, a pretty successful premiere for the movie. Can you tell me a little bit about like how you experienced that, but also like what you did to get like the word out and uh, yeah, like I'm just curious. So we made the movie in Portland, Oregon, um, which is on the West Coast, right north of California. It was the Hollywood theater where we premiered our movie. Um, and that's like the biggest, uh, most historic theater in Portland. It's a really like where all the film lovers go. I believe like Tarantino owns a piece of the theater and he like visits there often and does little talks and stuff. Like it's a pretty cool theater. And I went there and saw a local premiere around the time that we were kind of wrapping up post for I Need You Dead. And I ran into Dan Halstead, who is the programmer there. And I was like, hey, Dan, like, I love what you guys do at the Hollywood, like, big, big fan. I've been making this movie locally in Portland, um, all Portland crew, all Portland cast, like, I would love to premiere I Need You Dead here. Um, and I had a little bit of a relationship with him before because I had actually brought Lloyd Kaufman to Portland to show his movie, uh, Return to Nukem High Volume 2 at that theater. So I had a little bit of a repertoire with Dan at this point. And he was like, hey man, it's done. Premiere here, great. And they have a huge auditorium, a, a giant screen. Like I was like, oh my God, dream come true. Like I did not think he was just gonna say yes that easily. But Dan is an amazing guy. The Hollywood theater is a true independent. It's, it's awesome. So, okay, so now we know that we're premiering at the Hollywood, which has an auditorium of like 400 people or something. And we're like, Okay, so we gotta like fill those seats. And uh, so yeah, it was out to uh, lots of promoting. We released like three trailers, um, two of which were filmed um, entirely for the trailer. Like it didn't include clips from the movie. We like shot trailers that were kind of like concept trailers. Um, and those helped a lot. Um, but there was just a lot of word of mouth because I Need You Dead was a movie made in Portland Everyone who worked on it live in Portland. And so the word was just out and about that there was this local horror movie debuting at the Hollywood. And uh, we sold out like a few days before the show. Um, and what actually made it crazy was that um, it was the day before our premiere that our governor said that all theaters were gonna get shut down because of COVID, like shut down. And the Hollywood contacted me and they were like, hey, man, we might have to cancel the premiere. I know we're sold out, but I think we got to cancel. And I and they were like, we're going to in the morning, we're going to let you know, like our final decision. And I was like, please, like literally my whole life has been leading up to this moment. We're sold out. Every person in the city is about to see like my first movie, like, oh, my God. And uh, I just like got a bottle of wine and just drowned myself that night just like crying all night just like stained red wine like blood all over my white nightshirt and in the morning i was just staring at my phone and eventually it came that email came in and he was like all right we're gonna show i need you dead and then we're gonna close the theater the next day they're like we're gonna you're move we're only going to make an exception for you. Um, they had a director flying in the next day and they canceled it. Like they really, I don't know what got in their system. I think, I think they just were like, ah, it's a local thing. Like we can't, you know, the whole town is involved. And so they let it go and we had the premiere and everybody came and it was amazing. And I, the whole time <laughs> I'm such a wreck. The whole time the premiere was happening, I was shaking and felt super hot in my seat. And I had become convinced that I had COVID. And I was like, I, I'm i spreading it to everyone in the theater. Like everyone in the theater is gonna die at my premiere because I, the director killed them with COVID. And like, 
I was totally convinced. And then the second that the credits started rolling, I suddenly like felt fine. And I was like, oh, it was like the movie. Like I was like nervous. I was just the nerves of the premiere happening and people actually seeing it. And it was so pretty crazy experience, but a huge celebration afterwards. And everybody was so happy. And, and then every movie theater closed the next morning and there were no theaters for like a good year or two after that. Yeah, so you must have had quite a gap between, well, a very obviously exciting and successful premiere, but that must, that, that tastes like more. You want to like, let's have the next screening and the next one, but. Oh yeah. So that, that, that must have been frustrating. Really frustrating. Before the pandemic was a thing, the plan was that I was gonna book screenings all around the United States uh, and I was gonna drive to each town essentially and like be there for each screening, bring cast and crew. It would be like we were a band on tour and we would kind of like run the show and the day before the show we'd hang flyers up and tell people about it and that was our plan. Was that planned already? Was that organized already? No, not yet. We, we were kind of like, let's do the premiere and make sure that the audiences like it. And then we'll like, that's step two. And I was very excited to do that. Um, and I actually come from a background of being in a band and booking tours. So like, I was like, I knew what I was getting into and I was very excited to do it that way. But yeah, then COVID happened and it was kind of like, well, let's just wait a few months and see if this dies down. Cause nobody knew how long, you know, nobody had any idea. Um, and then once it became like four or five months, we were like, okay, we should like, just let's just pretend like this is never gonna end now. So now how do we show the movie? So that's what we came up with the drive-in. We, we actually rented an office with a huge parking lot and we would just at night go up on the roof and drape a screen over. And uh, we sold showings of the movie so people could watch it in their car and it was COVID safe. And we did five or six screenings that way and sold them out. And uh, we even did a, a Bad Taste video film festival where we showed independent films from all over the world and locals in Portland. And it was great. So we, we made the best of it, you know, and that's just what filmmaking is all about. Nothing is ever going to go your way, but that doesn't mean you got to turn around. You just got to get creative. What, what I, I obviously want to give you the opportunity to, to share and tell people where can they watch I Need You Dad? Uh, yeah, so I Need You Dad is super accessible. You can watch it on Amazon, Roku, Voodoo, um, Apple TV, you can rent it on YouTube, Google Play. So in terms of streaming, super easy to watch. And you can watch it if you're, you know, if you're low on cash like me, uh, you can watch it on Voodoo uh, for free, but it just has ads. So there's, there's that too. Um, and then in terms of getting it on DVD, um, you can get it on Walmart's website, Best Buy's website, Barnes and Noble's website. Um, and soon uh, we're going to be doing a release with uh, some guys called Horror Boobs. And they're going to do a VHS release of the movie. And it's, uh, it's, it's currently slated to come with a little creature toy with it. So uh, that'll be fun. So keep your eyes out for that too if you're kind of like a VHS nerd like I am. So what's next? You've been working on the script for two and a half years. Is that your main focus right now? Um, yeah, so we are wrapping up the script, finally. You know, I Need You Dead was so narratively experimental and just kind of all over the place in a way that I was like really, really loving when we were doing the movie. And I still love it, I think it's great. But uh, you know, it, it kind of, it's kind of like a bulletproof movie where like, I, there, it kind of like is designed in a way where there can't be anything wrong with the story um, because it's just supposed to be chaos at a certain level. Um, so I kind of wanted to do the opposite of that with this next movie. And I wanted to make something that to me rang more in the style of something like Back to the Future where it's like, narratively really satisfying and like it's still complex and it's still interesting and really creative but by the end you're like wow that all really tied together in like a really creative and nice cool way um and you leave maybe feeling a little bit better than you leave <laughs> leaving i need you dead where you probably feel a bit more like oh uh... so you know yeah so it's like i have no doubt i could do another i need you dead 
but like to do something that's like a little bit more of like a pop song of a movie while still retaining kind of a style that I want to challenge the audience with that sounded really interesting to me so that's kind of the direction we're going for this this next one which is currently titled flapjacks awesome and is there is there the plans for like production to start or is that like a little too uh, eager or oh i think about it every day every time i'm in a line or i'm getting on the subway or i'm taking out the trash i just say to myself i just want to make a movie <laughs> i just want to make a movie so the goal is that we will start shooting this year. I don't know when, could be November, could be this summer. Um, a lot of it's gonna have to do with money because the plan is to raise $100,000 for this movie. So that's a pretty big, that's about four times more than we had for I Need You Dead. So it's a big jump, but because we have I Need You Dead as a calling card now, uh, that sounds like much more reasonable to me than it was before, where before I Need You Dead, I had, you know, some silly short films from high school, but that wasn't going to raise us any serious cash. So, uh, and now we have a fan base for I Need You Dead. And hopefully if we started like an Indiegogo or something, those people would come out of the woodwork to help support and help us fundraise. And um, yeah, so hopefully this year, hopefully we'll be shooting this year. And if anybody in your audience wants to come to New York City, and work on this movie, no matter where you are in the world, um, you are welcome. The doors are open to be on our crew. You don't need any experience whatsoever. Come with a passion to learn. Instead of spending, you know, fifty thousand dollars to go to film school for one year, spend five grand and come to New York, have a place to live or whatever. I mean, probably not even five grand, probably a grand or two, and come work on this movie and make it your film school. Fuck up on our movie, make mistakes. You know, hang that light in the wrong place, smash the camera on the ground, whatever. Like, come here and don't be afraid that you're not going to be good enough or that you don't have the experience because our movies are film school for people. So the doors are wide open and you can email me at uh, rocco.badtaste at gmail.com at any time. And I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that and how they can come out and work on it. And and yeah. And like, like socials, like where can we follow you? Where can we follow Bad Taste Video? So the big social media that we tend to be most active on is on Instagram uh, because it is a visual medium. Uh, so at bad.taste.video is our Instagram handle. Um, we're on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. We're on YouTube, obviously. Um, so yeah, follow us on there and we post lots of opportunities, not just for like my features, but whenever there's uh, work going on that we are aware of, we tend to try to like post and share. So if there's uh, some film work or a film opportunity in your area, uh, we will hopefully be posting that and you can get involved that way. And we try to be a, you know, communicate those kinds of things on, as much as we can. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Rocco. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on. And, you know, it's it's really hard for, for people like me to kind of have a platform to even talk about their experiences and what it's like to be in your early 20s in dealing with this kind of stuff, because people typically just want to talk to the people who have already done it all. And, you know, I love Lloyd and people of that era, but you know, they have a different, they had a different upbringing in the seventies. Like it was a different world. What we're dealing with now is so, so different. Um, and so kudos to you for opening the door to, for someone like me to be able to even talk to your audience and share my experience, you know, even though I'm not some famous dude who's going to rake in the views. Like I really, I really appreciate you having me on. It means a lot. And that's that. Thank you guys for watching. I'm so sorry that I rarely post on YouTube anymore. Like, these last two videos took me way too long to finish. Just, I, you know, like, life, am I right? But I do really want to post more often, and I think I'm gonna try and focus a little more on just like, more like shorter content. Because with that I feel like it'll be easier for me to just like go and sit down and actually make stuff for the channel instead of making like these 25, 30 minute videos like every time it's just like a, woo, it's a lot, you know? So if anything, please follow me on Instagram if you don't already. It's just like, my account is just horrible.reviews. Over there, I'm probably gonna ask for like a little bit of input for like ideas for like these, these shorter form videos. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's try that. Cheers, guys. Have a nice day.